Hi there, precious friends. Today we're beginning a new study. How's your love life? This study is going to help us understand God's divine love. It's different from other kinds of love. God's Word tells us about it in 1 Corinthians 13. So get your Bible and let's talk about it. First Corinthians was the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth. Corinth was the chief city of Greece. It was a thriving, prosperous city. Traffic from everywhere around came through Corinth. All directions were headed toward Corinth. And so her wealth and luxury grew from her strategic location. Corinth had been destroyed by the Romans in 146 BC. And then a hundred years later, Julius Caesar rebuilt it. It was largely populated by Romans and also had many Jews. As it became a major trade center, it also became a major entertainment center. And they hosted great athletic festivals. And amid the wealth and luxury and intellect and pride and philosophy and entertainment, there was paganism. All of those who did not believe in God. There was a famous temple there to Venus, sometimes called Aphrodite. Uh, that's the mythological goddess of love. And that temple to Venus in Corinth housed 1,000 priestesses or temple prostitutes. So that tells you something about the city. It tells you something about what the people were being exposed to. And even the pagan world recognized the city's immorality and corruption. The word Corinthian became a synonym for all kinds of loose living. About 50 AD, toward the end of his second missionary journey, the Apostle Paul founded a church in Corinth. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17, if you want to read about it later, uh, gives us the record of the beginning of the Corinthian church. The record tells us that when the Corinthians heard the gospel, many of them believed and were baptized. The Lord also spoke to Paul saying, I have many people in this city. Now, Corinth was probably the last place you would expect the Lord to have many people. But that's what God said. And the Corinthian church had terrific potential for spiritual power and blessing. But their pagan background and their surroundings and their communities was, were a stumbling block and a source of confusion for the church. They had grown up around it. They had grown up in it. They were saturated by it. And as new believers, they didn't always quite know what to do with it. But the scriptures tell us that the church lacked no resources. They lacked no spiritual gifts. They had all of them. Their theology was good. But somehow they could not break away from the sin and the culture around them. And so some writers use the word they could not be de-Corinthianized because the word Corinthian meant loose living. So they need to be de-Corinthianized. So about five years after Paul had planted the, Cor the Corinthian church, that was about 55 AD, then Paul received distressing news about what was going on in the church. And their testimony was spoiled and they were in a mess and they were a mess. And so Paul was in Ephesus on his third missionary journey when he got this news. And so Paul wrote them a letter. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of First Corinthians in the New Testament of your Bible. And you will see that he tells us that two things prompted him to write this letter to the Corinthians. The first one is in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul says this, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Here it is. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. So that was the first reason that he gave for writing the letter. Now, if you flip over to chapter 7 and look at verse 1, there is another indication of why he wrote the letter. He begins chapter 7 with this phrase, Now concerning the things about which you wrote. So apparently the Corinthians have sent Paul a letter, and it's full of questions. They need instruction. They want help. And so Paul writes them a letter back. Now, the first 11 chapters of 1 Corinthians are corrective. Uh, then chapters 12 through 16 give us lessons on things that are going to remedy their divisions and their carnality. Now, let me show you something. Back there in chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to read the first three verses. 1 through 3. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've already said the Corinthians were a mess. The church is a mess. But notice first thing, Paul calls them saints. Now the term saint clearly is defined here in God's word. You can know what a saint is by reading this introduction to 1 Corinthians. He says, to them that are sanctified in Jesus called saints, with all who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So who is a saint? Those, those of us, those of these people, those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, who call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Any believer, any true Christian is a saint tells us so right here. God says so in his word. So these people are in a mess. They are a mess. But Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, calls them saints. So believers are declared righteous by God the moment we're saved. But we don't always act like it, do we? So Paul is reminding them here of who they are. We are holy before God because we have faith, we believe, we have received and believe the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are times when our lives don't match our position. So Paul begins this whole letter by telling them, reminding them who they are. So this is the case with the Corinthians. Now notice he calls them the church of God, the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now, here they are, not acting like who they are. So Paul begins by reminding them that they were saints. Now look at verse 4. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you in the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, what he's affirming at the beginning is that they had 
everything necessary to accomplish what God had called them to do. What did he call them to do? They were a church. They were to be light in the darkness. They were to permeate that society with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to show you something. Verses 5 and 6, that in everything you were enriched in him, past tense, everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. Now look at verse 7. So that you are, present tense, not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 8, who shall confirm, future tense, who shall also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he was reminding them of what's happened to them in the past, what they have in the present, and where they're headed in the future. Then verse 10 begins with, now I exhort you, brethren, or some translations say, now I beseech you, brethren. So he says, basically, this is who you are. Now act like it. Sometimes we all need to be told that, don't we? This is who we are. You have been made holy. You are holy. Why are you acting unholy? So he's confronting them at the very beginning. And then he proceeds to discuss how they're going to have to change their behavior. Now, the theme of 1 Corinthians, the whole letter, is love. 1 Corinthians 13 uh, has been characterized uh, by some to be the deepest and purest and strongest aspect of spiritual life about which Paul ever wrote. Uh, It is beautiful. Uh, It is highly instructive. It is enlightening. It is convicting. And so I look forward to our taking this journey together through divine love in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, be aware that chapter 13 comes between chapter 12 and chapter 14, right? Makes sense. Chapter 12 talks about how God has richly gifted his church with spiritual gifts spiritual abilities. And he tells us that every believer has at least one spiritual gift. Now, we've all received gifts from the Holy Spirit. We've all been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit indwells us. And in chapter 12, he tells us about those spiritual gifts that were given to every believer. Every believer gets at least one when we're saved. And so we're given those to use to minister to the body of Christ. They're never about us. They're always about how the Holy Spirit is going to empower us to minister to the body of Christ. So you've got chapter 12. Then in chapter 14, we're given instructions about how to use those gifts. Uh, Dropped in between chapter 12, which defines the gifts, identifies them, and chapter 14, which tells us how to use them, there's this famous chapter 13, divine love, the love chapter. Love is the only atmosphere in which these gifts function properly. Now, chapter 1 and verse 7 tells us that the Corinthians believers, Corinthian believers had all the gifts. They had all the gifts. But they did not have the love that would allow them to use them with real power and blessing. They were not functioning properly because it was a church that had all the gifts but did not have any love. They were not content with the gifts that the Holy Spirit gave them. Let's say that the Holy Spirit gave to one the gift of mercy, and that person thought, well, I want to be up in front of everybody. I want a gift that's a speaking gift. I want a teaching gift. I want this gift. So they wound up being jealous of each other's gifts, not satisfied with what the Lord had given them. They wanted the attention and admiration for having gifts. They wanted it to be about them 
And Paul is teaching, this is not about you. This is not about you. This is not about feelings of ecstasy. This is not about all the stuff that you've let get involved in all of the gifts. This is about serving the body of Christ. And so they were proud. They were self-serving. They wanted spiritual prominence. They were operating in the flesh instead of in the spirit. And they even perverted some of the gifts so much that they were cursing the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul teaches us that love is the very foundation of a believer's life. Divine love is the thing that needs to permeate and flow through all of us believers. It is to control us. And that includes love for God and love for others. So Paul begins chapter 13 by telling them and us that anything without love is useless. It's performance. It's useless. We know that in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, the first fruit of the Spirit, there, there's fruit of the Spirit and there are gifts of the Spirit. They're not the same thing. The first fruit of the Spirit is love. Romans 13 says, love fulfills the whole law. In John chapter 13, Jesus told his disciples, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. So the church at Corinth was in a mess and it was a mess because it was a church without love. Without love, the activities and behaviors of religion have absolutely no value. Paul begins chapter 14 then with follow after love. That's your number one rule. That's your umbrella. That's your first clue on making a decision. Follow after love. Now, before we delve into chapter 13, I want us to get a picture of the package that chapters 12, 13, and 14 give us. Uh, think with me for a minute about having a brand new car. Wow. Let's assume that it is loaded. Anything that can be on a wonderful car is on this car, and it's your car. The purpose of your having the car is transportation. Um, you know that regardless of how much equipment is on the car, you can't take it anywhere unless it is propelled by the ignition and combustion and transmission of energy from the engine. In other words, you've got to be able to crank it, put it in gear, and accelerate it. Doesn't matter what's on there. It's not really any good to you unless you can crank it, put it in gear, and accelerate it. Now, when the car is parked in your garage or in your driveway, it has the potential to take you somewhere. That's potential energy. It could take you somewhere, but it's sitting there in the garage. The potential energy has to be actuated. And once that occurs, all the parts of the car start articulating together to give you this good, wonderful, efficient ride. And so it then has practical value instead of just potential value. It's working. It's carrying you somewhere. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Now think about this. Think about 1 Corinthians 12 being a loaded automobile. Every good thing that can be on a car is on the car. Every resource, every gift, it's all there. Chapter 13 is the ignition, the crank. It's the combustion and the transmission. It's when you actually crank the car and it's going to move you. That's chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 14 is the operation of all of the parts articulating together in an efficient manner. Without love... The purpose of the gifts and the activities of the body of Christ are never realized. 
Paul is very clear about that. Scripture is very clear about that. Jesus was very clear about that. It's just like having a big car and never driving it. Not making use of the fact that it is able to take you somewhere if you crank it and it's in the right environment. So between the endowment or the gifting of the gifts from the Holy Spirit and the exercise of those gifts, there's got to be the love of God. And that's why this whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, is tucked in there. Now that's the context of 1 Corinthians 13. When we are interpreting scripture, context is king. Context rules. You've got to see where it is, what's around it, how is it enveloped, how is it framed so that we can understand the application of what the Scripture is giving us. Let me give you an illustration about context. If I just said to you, to you the word uh, trunk, and that's all I said, what would you think? Well, you could think the trunk of an elephant. You could think the trunk of a car. You could think of a trunk that's a piece of luggage, but you're not going to know what I mean until I give you enough information to give the context. If I said to you, I saw a trunk at the zoo, aha, trunk on an elephant. If I said to you, my trunk is full of junk. Well, could make the trunk in my car, most likely. Could also be a trunk Maybe that I've got in storage that was used for a piece of luggage. So context is the issue. And so it's important that we understand the context of 1 Corinthians 13. Now, there are there is one interpretation that is based on the context, but there are many applications. We can apply 1 Corinthians 13 all over our lives, all day, every day, and go on and on with it. But here... The endowment of the gifts and the use of the gifts is the context of 1 Corinthians 13 because this is a church that was in a mess and was a mess. And so Paul is saying, this is what you're going to have to do to correct your mess. You're going to have to learn how to love one another. Love is the essence of the body of Christ. So as we take this journey through 1 Corinthians 13 together, we're going to learn about the behaviors and attitudes of God's divine love. Now, what you're going to find is that this is a different love from any other kind of love. Having God's divine love doesn't mean I like you. Having God's divine love means that I'm going to choose certain attitudes certain patterns of behavior which are like the character of Christ. God's love is a part of God's life. It's who he is. You cannot separate love from God. It is expressed through believers. So once we are saved and once we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit that saves us, we receive God's ability to love like he loves. That's when I have to stop and think, well, I know it's there, but I don't always live like it. So how do we do that? How do we bring ourselves into line with God's heart, God's attitude? It is the way a believer can show the world what God is like. When we choose to accept the characteristics of the divine love that is described in 1 Corinthians 13, the world will begin to know what God is like. That's what we're here for. We are here to, in a sense, replace Jesus in the world. Jesus is no longer here in bodily form, so God has put us here and empowered us with the Holy Spirit so that we can show the world what Jesus was like. Ugh. This kind of love is not a sweet, sentimental emotion. It is us Christians setting our wills to respond to others the way God responds, the way Christ responded. It is the way God has called us 
to conduct ourselves as the body of Christ. So I pray that in these upcoming lessons, we're going to be immersed in God's love. We're going to allow his love to become our motive for all that we do. Maybe in the process, you might even want to begin memorizing 1 Corinthians 13. It's a good thing to have around in your head. And it's a good thing to know and understand as we go about the business of showing the world what God's love is like. Let's pray. Father, we cannot do this on our own. We can't muster it up. We can't cheer it up. We cannot do it apart from the gifting, from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will teach each one of our hearts that the number one thing before anything else is that we are to love one another the way God loves. That doesn't mean that we will always feel good about each other or like each other. It is a choice of behavior that you have designed, that you perform, even toward those people who are your enemies. We can't understand that unless the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. So I pray that you will anoint this study, that you will empower it and use it, and that it will become information, knowledge, life change for us that will glorify you and the Lord Jesus Christ in this place. We're grateful to pray in the almighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. See you next time.